Hi, I'm Matt. This is Sean, Kevin, Ihar. We're here to talk to you about an interesting topic over a very long time called MTU, which seems to have been a cause of massive confusion and problems over several years and quite a few releases. And so this time around, we decided to figure out, well, why don't we fix the problem in Neutron that we've been having and kind of take a look at what actually is MTU and why has this become such a problem? And it's actually not that difficult. So it'd be kind of kind of interesting to explain where all this came from and how these problems came about. So the objectives of this, uh, learn about MTU and physical networks. So where does MTU come from? And it's been around for a very long time and it's only that now that we have virtual networks that things have become kind of a serious problem. Uh, learn about the nuances and particularly with virtual networks. So tunnels, uh, whether they're VXLAN or GRE or whatever, add a little bit of overhead to your packets and this has been kind of what caused the primary problem in Neutron. Review some of the confusing MTU options and workarounds or as I would call them hacks in releases prior to Mitaka. So some of the ways that uh, we've figured out kind of how to get around the MTU issue in some situations and the big deal with those is they're kind of indeterminate, very specific as to how your setup works. Apply the MTU knowledge to reveal issues in OpenStack. And I mentioned OpenStack as opposed to just Neutron because Nova plays a role in this as well. If you recall, there's some bridges on the Nova side that do security groups, and they also have to have the correct MTU. And we'll learn about uh, the MTU solution in Mataka. So we'll just recap what exactly a maximum transmission unit is, uh, just briefly for background. Um, it is the largest network layer 3 data unit that the underlying data link layer can pass between a transmitter and a receiver. Um, so the common standard is 1500 bytes for Ethernet. Uh, however, many devices actually support uh, larger frames, which are commonly called jumbo frames. Now, when you have a transmitter and a receiver where the packets are crossing multiple networks, you run into the issue of where the transmitter and the receiver may not actually have the same uh, MTU. So within layer three, there are ways that you can actually discover the MTU for a path and then be able for the transmitter and the receiver to negotiate an MTU so that then communication can proceed. <clears throat> so with IPv4, there was a RFC where they discovered that even though packets can be fragmented and then reassembled on the receiver side, the performance was extremely slow. And any loss of a single fragment would require a retransmit of the entire packet. So they put together a proposal to do what is called path discovery uh, for MTU, where they would send the do not fragment bit in a packet. And when the MTU changed, whatever hop that was would send back an ICMP packet saying uh, the MTU is too large, send me a smaller one, and it would actually include the MTU of uh, the next hop. So that eventually the, the receiver and the, I'm sorry, the sender would then figure out the MTU and then be able to send it all the way to the receiver with no packet reassembly um, with much better throughput. With IPv6, uh, they removed the feature of fragmenting packets um, and then they will generate MTU. There will be an MTU, the smallest MTU is 1280 bytes, uh, where it's the same type of operation where if you hit a hop where the MTU is smaller than the packet that the size that you've sent, it's sent back to the uh, sender and the negotiation happens and then if it is successful, the communication between the sender and the receiver can continue. So just this is an il illustration of this. If you have uh, a host with a jumbo frame set and if there is a part in the network where the MTU shrinks before you actually hit a layer three device, uh, the packet is actually dropped. Uh, and since there is no layer three device where the ICMP protocol is available, uh, the sender actually never receives anything about what happened to that packet. Uh, this is also just an anecdote. Uh, 
where if you have middle boxes such as firewalls that block IMs, ICMP, uh, this would also cause traffic issues as well because if you block ICMP between a sender and a receiver and they never get the ICMP control message, uh, they have no way to adjust down uh, their MTU. So as you can see, this is where we have a layer three device in between uh, where there's a host that has a 9,000 MTU and a host with 1,500. You can see that as the traffic crosses the boundary of the one router, uh, the ICMP packet is sent back to the sender which then adjusts its MTU accordingly, and then it's able to pass through the traffic down to the smaller network. So I'm gonna hand it off to Kevin. So in, inside of ML2, there are different ways that uh, the tenant networks can actually be set up for their traffic to be carried on the real provider of the operator's network underneath. Um, this impacts that the MTU that the instances will need to use to safely pass traffic onto the network. Uh, the easiest one to start out with is the, f the flat type, and that's just using Ethernet passed straight through. So if an instance sends a packet, it's just passed directly onto a physical interface. So the instance's uh, MTU can be exactly the same as the underlying physical network MTU. And VLAN is similar because the VLAN tag that's added to the Ethernet frame doesn't impact the maximum payload size that can be sent onto the network. So the instances in that case can also use the exact same MTU that's configured on the operator's network. Where this changes is with uh, overlay networks that use encapsulation in a higher level protocol. So like v VXLAN or GRE, we're taking the tenant's Ethernet frames, packing them into an IP frame, and then sending that onto the real Ethernet underneath. So you have to subtract all the overhead that's added by those outer uh, frames and use that as the MTU inside the instances. Otherwise, by the time everything gets packed up, it'll exceed the MTU of the underlying network. And so here we have a diagram that kind of illustrates this for VXLAN as an example. So if the provider's network underneath is 1500 byte MTU, we have to take off the VXLAN overhead, which is comprised of the IP header, the UDP header, the VXLAN header, and then the internet Ethernet header for the, uh, the, v, the tenant's Ethernet traffic. So that only leaves 1,450 bytes left over for the instance MTU to use. So that has to be advertised or configured via metadata uh, on the instances to work on a 1,500 byte underlying network. Uh, for GRE, it's basically the same thing, except it do, it's not based on UDP, so it doesn't have the extra UDP header. So it has an extra eight bytes that the instances can use in the 1500 use case, because it only has an eight byte GRE header and the uh, inner Ethernet header and the IP header on it. Okay, Matt. So some interesting observations about <coughs> various uh, kinds of, well, Open vSwitch and Linux Bridge are pretty much the two most popular things. And one thing we found during testing of this, so the code basically said one thing. And what I found in tests actually found an, uh, result, revealed another thing. I was like, I wonder what's going on here. Well, it turns out that Linux in and of itself manages MTU fairly well. So, for example, if you put an Ethernet interface with an MTU of 1500 and you plug a VXLAN interface into it, the VXLAN interface automatically accounts for the extra 50 bytes and says 1450 on it. Well, this sort of interferes with anything in Neutron that's trying to override that, but it kind of depends. If you're using Open vSwitch, for example, a lot of the components are in open vSwitch, say, on your network node or where your L3 agent runs. But where your instances run, there's a Linux bridge that's doing security groups for you. And that's pretty much managed by the Linux side of things. So <clears throat> a couple notes about with open vSwitch is it kind of internally doesn't really have an MTU or it's arbitrarily large. And you kind of have to treat it as sort of just like 65,000 bytes, for example. And that's okay until something leaves open vSwitch and then it hits like a real interface with an MTU of say 1500. So you might be able to send a 9,000 byte packet somewhere into open vSwitch and it looks like it's fine, but until it hits a real interface with a smaller MTU, it may just mysteriously get dropped. Looking at the Linux bridge side of things, <clears throat> 
Um, as I said, it automatically configures tunnel network interface MTU by subtracting the overlay protocol overhead. Other things are bridges. Bridges assume the MTU of the lowest MTU interface plugged into it. So if you have two interfaces at 1500 plugged into a bridge and you plug in 1450, the whole bridge gets 1450. So this is where things get interesting when you're trying to manually set stuff or when Neutron will set an MTU when it builds a device. If you plug something later into that device with a different MTU, it changes and Neutron doesn't actually know about it. The other thing Linux allows you to do is virtual Ethernet pairs or VETH pairs can have different MTUs on either end. And this is roughly equivalent to having a switch with two different MTUs on ports and there's no layer three in between. So one thing we found that was fairly uh, significant is that VETH pairs would have different MTUs inside Neutron and drop packets mysteriously. So people would have a lot of trouble saying, well, I can't find where my packet's getting dropped. And it turns out it's because it was inside of a VETH pair. So some of you are probably familiar with some of the ways that people have sort of worked around MTU problems in Neutron. And a lot of this, I said, it's indeterminate. It may look like it does one thing, but depending on whether you're using tunnel networks or VLAN networks or mixing stuff in a router, you could wind up with any number of situations. I know there was some talks yesterday about troubleshooting neutron stuff, and I think a lot of it ended up being kind of MTU issues that were sort of hidden. Oh, my VM worked, and then I plugged another VM in with another kind of network, and all of a sudden nothing works. Is it neutron's fault? Not necessarily. So uh, a couple notes here. Uh, there's obvious uh, or lacks obvious and consistent support for MTUs larger than 1500. Uh, 1500 is pretty standard and works, but I know a lot of you have 10 gig networks, maybe 40 gig networks, and you've said, oh, I want to provide 9,000 byte jumbo frames directly to my instances. How many here have had actual luck doing that? <laughs> I don't see a lot of hands. Okay, so I guess we're right about that one. And uh, the other thing was, by default, Nova creates security group bridges and interfaces using a 1500 byte MTU. So even if you got the o open vSwitch side and all your L3 agent stuff to look okay, as soon as you get a bridge created, it winds up being 1500 and your packet stops there. Um, features claiming to address MTU involve confusing and often useless options. And prior to about Kilo, we didn't really even make a comment that it was supported. Then Kilo gained a couple of options that were really confusing as to what they actually did. So advertise MTU was a neutron core, physical network MTUs was an ML2, path MTU was an ML2. You'll see that these vary by the different kinds of either plugin or agent you're using, or whether it's available to your plugin or what's in neutron. So it's a lot of different options around. Um, VETH MTU only works if you use VETH pairs with open vSwitch, and I think most people kind of got rid of those after getting away from CentOS 6, as my guess, or older kernels. Network device MTU. Um, sort of disappeared. Uh, Nova deprecated it, even though it did have a purpose, and that was one of the little secrets to getting larger MTUs to work. Only some plugins support the MTU API extension. Uh, back in Kilo, there was a value added to networks that indicate what MTU it is, and your instances could read off of that and figure it out. If you don't, can't see it, or you don't support it, then it's hard to know. And then, of course, the last one was what documentation. Uh, that's a serious problem in general with Neutron. So a couple of things that people were doing, uh, starting with Folsom, this is about when this stuff came about. Environment, uh, general settings, people would implement a slightly larger MTU on the physical network, so say 1550, and then the VMs could use 1500 and things would be fine with your tunnel networks using VXLAN or whatever MTU you needed. Um, problem is, this causes an issue with networks that are not tunnel-based, because all of a sudden they can support a 1550. They might try to announce a 1550, but nothing else really supports that. So you're, you're moving the problem, essentially. Your 50-byte issue is, well, my tunnel networks are now going to work, but now my provider networks are not going to work, or something like that. So a lot of these issues just move it around based on what your architecture is. Um, you can manually configure DNS mask uh, to provide a smaller MTU to your instances, but this applied to every instance. It wasn't just instances on a tunnel network. So now your VLAN network your instances would get a larger, or the wrong MTU, usually smaller. So you're fighting a battle here, essentially. 
Uh, Nova and Neutron, those config attempt to use network device MTU to configure the MTU of virtual network components. Kind of works. We're going to see in a little while that it actually doesn't. And then for the Open vSwitch plug-in, back when it was a plug-in and then it turned into an agent, um, if you're using VTH interfaces, you can use the VTH MTU option, which sort of worked too. There's a lot of sort of here. So for Kilo and Liberty, a new option came in uh, called Path MTU, Advertise MTU. You could mix some of these options together. And the big one was Advertise MTU, because that means that the MTU of the network is read essentially off of the API value and passed into your instance via DHCP. So now in only instances on certain kinds of networks can receive hopefully the appropriate MTU for their network. If you don't use DHCP, you could configure it via some sort of other metadata. Uh, that was the reason for having it in the API so that you're not locked into using DHCP. Also RA for those using V6. There's a couple other options in there. Uh, attempt to use a variety of them actually, so mixing segment MTU and physical network MTUs again, and then mixing more options together. So how many of you have mixed a whole lot of options together and hoped something just came out of it that worked? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at a couple common use cases, and this is where I ran a bunch of experiments to figure out what actually happens with MTU in various configurations and various agents. So this assumes proper configuration of underlying physical network. We're using Liberty for these tests. We're using VXLAN with IPv4 endpoints, so it's 50 bytes of overhead. If you do V6 endpoints, it adds another 20 bytes to it. Um, cases 1 through 4 only use path MTU and advertise MTU. And these were the only subtly documented options that came out in Kilo. And so that's the ones that I think most people were trying to figure out how to use. And then cases five and six, we'll also see what happens with network device MTU because it changes the field a little bit. So here's Open vSwitch with a 1500-byte MTU. And the way the colors work out here is stuff that looks green is working, stuff that looks red is not working. And there's also a case of yellow where it might work, depending on the situation. So keep in mind that different services or different things that use the TCP stack or UDP stack have better ways of determining the maximum packet they can send. Like ping, for example, unless you tell it otherwise, always sends a tiny packet. So ping always seems to work. And how many here have had cases where ping works great and nothing else works in their VMs? Security groups are good, everything looks good. You're like, what's wrong? You do an SSH with a debug mode, and you find it gets stuck in key exchange? Yeah, <laughs> that one. That's the MTU problem. You've hit it somewhere. So for advertise MTU equals true, in the case of 1500, your VM or instance gets a 1450, which makes sense. And then everything else in here assumes, 14, or assumes 1500, things just magically work. Looking at Open vSwitch agent with a 9000 byte, well, you'll notice the Linux bridge over there that does the security groups for the instance is still 1500. So you essentially have a layer 2 discrepancy in your MTU between 8950 at the instance and 1500 at the Linux bridge. So your packets would mostly make it all the way in there. And you'll notice at the bottom here, there's kind of the yellowy color at the router namespace. And even though there's an MTU discrepancy here, and it kind of looks like it's happening at layer two, because you're eventually going from a switch. You might remember OVS has this magically large MTU. And the way that those interfaces in the router namespace with OVS are created, they're not VETH pairs. They're kind of just a patch port that's moved into a namespace. This will actually emit the MTU path discovery packets. Don't know exactly why, but it does. And so if you have a large packet coming in, the router namespace will actually kick it back and say, you can't do that. However, if you have a large packet originating from the instance, it will get dropped. So this is Linux bridge agent with 1500-byte MTU. And you would think this would just work, too. Well, it turns out it actually doesn't. Um, not in all cases. So there's a red section there. You'll notice that the QR namespace, the VETH pair, so Linux Bridge uses VETH pairs all over. And in the router namespace, you get a 1500 on the QR, and as soon as it gets into Linux Bridge, it has a 1450. So you could run into potential problems there. Has anyone here actually run into problems trying to even use 1500 with Linux Bridge before? I know it comes up with various protocols. So here's what happens with 9000. And you can see that basically the interfaces that are inside namespaces are simply not touched. 
with their MTU. They stay 1500. Because these interfaces are not connected to any real physical device and are sort of residing in their own namespace, Linux doesn't handle MTU calculations for it. So you can see that packets are going to get stuck somewhere between the Linux bridge that goes to the external interface and the Linux bridge on the inside. So the other case was network device MTU. What happens when you set this? So if you set this to 9000, you'll notice that there's an MTU discrepancy that shows up between your instance and the Linux bridge that's doing your security groups. So that's still there. And you can tweak things a little bit to try to get around that. Uh, like I said, some people will just up their physical network MTU to get around the 50 byte limitation. And then there's also an issue where the OBS switch, and when I say OBS components, I imply all the OBS bridges, I just wrap them into one. When it connects to the tunnel interface, this is a physical interface, all of a sudden it has an MTU that it has to deal with. So your packet might make it through, and OBS says, well, I'm going to add tunnel header to it. So it comes in at 9,000, tries to add 50 to it, now you get 9,050. Well, your network doesn't support 9,050, so you've added a header that that tunnel interface is going to reject. Linux bridge, uh, sort of a similar problem. You'll notice that network device MTU does impact the interfaces inside namespaces, so this was a good thing. However, it still had the same problem with the Linux bridge itself going towards the instances having 8950 in it. I'm going to pass it over to IHAR to describe how we're sort of fixing this. Um. So, uh, as we have seen, we have mul multiple configuration uh, options. We have uh, some code to handle MTU, but it doesn't actually help in all of the cases. And uh, so, we've looked at what we have and uh, set a goal. Uh, you don't really, you, you should not need to modify all those configuration options if you have a standard uh, setup that just uh, uses a standard Ethernet uh, MTU size. And uh, also, if, you're, if you need to change it to, for example, support uh, Jumbo frames, then you should be able to modify just uh, to determine a single value, set it in the configuration file, and uh, be done with it. And also, another thing is that once you have this MTU calculated for your network, it should actually be applied to the whole L2 data path uh, that traverses, uh, that the traffic traverses, uh, so that it actually works. Uh, so for um, in Neutron, we already have this code that calculates MTU for, for uh, virtual networks. The problem is that it was not actually enabled. Uh, you would need to to um, to change the MTU value uh, in the configuration file. Uh, if it was not done, then your networks effectively got as an MTU value of zero, which in several places of the code uh, just disabled the feature, including the advertisement of MTU uh, to instances, uh, which is not nice. Uh, so. Another part uh, of the problem is that, as was already mentioned, Nova uh, participates in uh, in setting the uh, the data path, and uh, even if we would uh, would apply the calculated MTU just on neutron side, it's not enough, at least for Jumbo frames. So that's another part of the work that uh, the value calculated should be propag propagated to Nova, and then Nova itself should should use this value to update the devices that it creates. Um, and also, uh, as some of you may probably know, uh, at the moment uh, Nova and Neutron community has, uh, work on uh, a common library to handle virtual interfaces uh, called OSVIF. Um, it's not yet adopted uh, by any of those projects right now, but uh, there is a plan to do that. So uh, to make sure that we don't regress in the future, this library should, should have also been uh, updated uh, in a similar way as we uh, did on Nova side. Uh, so uh, 
one one thing uh, one problem that we had with the configuration options uh, on uh, on neutron side is that uh, the uh, the options that control MTU calculation uh, they were actually ML2 only. Uh, so, uh, if if you would want to implement a plugin and uh, uh, reuse the, this uh, value that is set in configuration uh, option, you don't actually have a proper way to access it. So, one thing that we did is just we moved the existing segment MTU option uh, from ML2 configuration file into a common one. So now, uh, if you are an author of a plugin, you can. Uh, properly access that and uh, implement uh, your kind, kind of uh, MTU calculation. Uh, also, we changed the default value for, uh, for MTU to 1500, which should work for most cases, right? Um, and Yeah, and uh, also another problem with the default values that we had was uh, uh, that even though mechanism to advertise MTU to instances was in place, again, it was disabled for some, some unclear reason. Uh, so we enabled that. So again, you, another configuration option that you don't need to touch. Uh, in Mitaka, uh, support for uh, IPv6 uh, advertisement uh, was introduced because before the only mechanism uh, that we had was DHCP option, which is IPv4 only, uh, so uh, which was not enough for, for IPv6. So uh, router advertisement packets that we sent were uh, expanded with uh, the MTU information. Uh, so now you can boot an IPv6 only instance and it will still get the proper MTU value set. Uh, so one thing that uh, there there was a bit of a debate uh, on uh, uh, whether the this single option is enough. Uh, obviously, uh, in uh, eighty percent of cases, you you have a single uh, MTU for your underlying network, and uh, you just. Uh, you don't want to have different uh, uh, different virtual networks uh, using different uh, MTU values uh, for underlying uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, but we we already had some options to to influence that uh, that you could could use to, for example, have different MTUs for different physical networks or use a different MTU for uh, f for uh, tenant networks that are passed thr through tunnels. Uh, so those options were already in place. Uh, those are path MTU and uh, physical network MTUs. Uh, so I think in the end we decided that uh, we can't be sure that, uh, that no one actually uses or relies on that. Uh, so it's better to 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 leave them uh, just in case, but actively discourage people to use them, uh, because if, if if you start having different MTUs for different uh, uh, physical uh, networks, it makes your troubleshooting process harder, and uh, there's no clear reason on why you even want to do that. But the options are still there. Uh, so one thing that uh, we were talking about how we solved everything in Mitaka, but uh, actually not like we, we haven't reached the, the goal that we've set completely. Uh, that's, uh, there are some glitches in the implementation. One thing is that uh, we've, we've said before that we want just a single configuration option that you set in a single place and be done with that. Well, actually, in Mitaka, you, you still need to set two configuration options to the same value. One is the intended one, global FizzNet MTU, uh, 
but still you need to set the same value for path MTU uh, option in, if you use ML2 plugin. It's just a glitch in the code, you need to, to be aware of that, and in Newton it's, it will be solved. So um, another problem that we have is uh, even though configure MTU calculation mechanism is in place and it's now enabled by default, we don't actually apply it for existing networks. So if you already have network resources created and they were created at the moment when the default option, the default values were not uh, were not uh, corresponding to the the actual physical infrastructure, it means that the the network resources get MTU equals zero, and then uh, then your DHCP agent or router is not able to advertise the proper value to instances, and we don't ever recalculate the value. So at this moment, if if you want to uh, to switch to the new world and you already have resources, the only uh, safe way to do that is to recreate resources. Uh, you obviously can. Uh, can get into your database and manually update uh, columns, uh, the column values there to, to correspond to proper MTU values, but obviously that's not unsafe. Uh, but we have it uh, f planned for to, to be tackled in Newton. We will probably uh, enable this calculation mechanism. Um, we will do it not just when we create the resource, but every time you you fetch the the network. So uh, that's all cool. Mitaka, Newton, um, everything is sort of fixed. Uh, the question is, uh, who who is using Mitaka right now? Okay, one, two. Uh, so uh, the obvious question is, uh, w what are we going to do with the uh, previous releases? Uh, because not everyone wants to, to switch to Mitaka right now. So uh, we looked at the set of patches that we came up uh, to fix uh, the MTU issues we, uh, we had. Uh, and we've identified the patches that are um, needed uh, to, to fix the, the problem. Um, and there were actually not that many, uh, like four, five. We still have some reviews uh, uh, up and not merged. Uh, they, uh, they span Nova and Neutron, but we plan to, to land them in the next uh, minor stable releases for uh, Liberty. Uh, and uh, obviously this, uh, this patch is uh, mostly they, they touch the MTU value on the data path, but they uh, do not change uh, the default configuration values because uh, this is against uh, upstream stable policy, uh, meaning that even with those patches, you would need to, uh, to set some more uh, uh, configuration options in your configuration files. Uh, specifically, you should uh, enable the advertisement for MTU, uh, you should set uh, this segment MTU option uh, to uh, to reflect your MTU for physical network, even if it's just uh, 1500. Uh, also, make sure that you unset network device MTU both on Neutron and Nova side, because the, those are kind of in conflict with uh, the new approach. And again, if you have existing resources, you would, would probably want to somehow handle this uh, problem uh, that MTU column is not really updated. Uh, but again, it's uh, be cautious. Uh, and as for previous releases, Kilo and uh, before, uh, we don't plan any, uh, any kind of work. We don't plan to, to backport anything. So you are on your own. Obviously, you can still go uh, and try to ident identify the patches that, uh, that you may try to backport. It may even work, but honestly, guys, um, you probably uh, just want to upgrade.
So uh, the next steps uh, that we plan for Newton, uh, obviously uh, we need to tackle this uh, problem with existing resources uh, and uh, also the old options should, should be deprecated, cleaned up, removed, uh, both the Nova and Neutron side, uh, not just network device MTU but probably also advertise MTU should go away because you there is no clear um, reason not to have it enabled. Uh, finally, uh, since the OS VAIF library is going to be introduced in Newton, we should make sure that uh, it's properly adopted and that the MTU still works. Uh, we'll see. And, uh, and the last thing uh, to note is a lot of the, the time when Neutron was not really playing nice with MTU was so long that a lot of deployment tools came up with their own hacks. They configured DNS mask manually to pass some MTU values. Uh, those hacks should be removed as soon as possible. And we will work with uh, some of those uh, tools to do that. That's it. So just want to kind of conclude a little bit of what we talked about. The main problem was that you can't change MTUs over layer 2. It has to be changed over layer 3. So when we moved over into the neutron side of things, all of a sudden we were having a lot of these issues where VEATH pairs had different MTUs. VEATH pairs essentially is a layer 2 thing, or bridges for example, and we were causing packet loss in various places. So by sort of experimentation and looking at the code, figured out where all the problems were and realized that we weren't setting MTU everywhere where it needs to be, and if there needs to be a change, it needs to happen in a layer three device, such as a router namespace. And you saw from the experiments that the, well, you've seen from the explanation of what's going on in Mataka, that we have fixed the actual underlying problem. The options aren't necessarily as clear as we wanted them to be. So for 90 or more percent of the networks out there, you should have an underlying MTU of, say, 9,000 on all your physical devices. And you tell Neutron, I have a 9,000 MTU on my physical devices, and it does all the calculations for you. Unfortunately, we have to undo several releases worth of options that are confusing, not necessarily Im implementing what they should have. And so it's going to take a little bit longer than we thought to actually get this down to most people are going to use a single option. And then if for oddball cases, there's going to be options that have not only good descriptions and documentations, but the option itself perhaps makes sense. So you kind of know what it references versus like, so for example, path MTU, segment MTU, how many noticed that there's a difference between those and what it actually means? I didn't think anybody knew. We didn't really know either. So that was a whole lot of fun to fix. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, but even if you have to set some crazy values now, the MTU problem is resolved. You can use jumbo frames inside Neutron and with your VMs. So questions? Don't throw tomatoes at me. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Just one critic and one question. Start with the critic. If OpenStack was only for users to use on their laptops, this conference will be not here in the basement of somebody else's house. So once this is just this is an addressing the enterprise and the carrier space, saying that, oh, seriously upgrade to Mitaka, seriously? The life cycle management of a release is minimum 12 to 16 months for an upgrade. That's the minimum. We have sites in two tier one operators still running Grizzly. Imagine that. When you say upgrade, which is just released in this month to Mitaka, come on, be realistic. This is, this is not possible, okay? So there has to be a way to patch back at least necessary stuff. I'm not saying patch back to Grizzly. At least think about two releases back minimum. This is my critic. My question is, it's a good point. MT is a big problem, especially for VMs running as a cluster, as a backend. There's an over, you know, overlay network providing overhead with GRE, for example, 24 bytes, killing us all. So how about the things on the provider network side of the things? Because when you deal with the tenant network, you have some sort of a control on the network fabric in the, within data center. But when you go with the provider networks, more, more, more kind of tied with the f real network fabric of the whole IT infrastructure, where you have nothing but you have to learn what is the MTU end-to-end. -end. 
Do you have any best practice to apply in the provider network side? Thank you. Well, it depends on the type of provider network that you're using. Um, and I think that probably we'll be contributing some docs to the networking guide around best practices to use this. Correct, Matt? Yeah. And then I guess the other thing is, is that I do sympathize with your previous point about, you know, releases, especially in the telecom space and stuff like this, are supported for 18 months, so on and so forth. There's been many conversations that have been had in the OpenStack community, especially on the dev mailing list, about you know, extra stable releases that are maintain, maintained, but that's bubbled up all the way to the TC, and um, those, those discussions are ongoing, and I certainly encourage you to voice your opinion on that. However, um, OpenStack itself moves at an incredibly fast pace, and I understand that you're, you're worried about that, but it... <clears throat> the thing is, is that there's only a finite amount of resources in the community to maintain releases or develop new releases, and there's been a strategic choice that has been made to do more releases and try and maintain a, only a small subset into a stable. So, And another thing to, to touch on, too, if you're simply using provider networks, so you're doing VLAN or flat, that's going straight into your compute nodes, a lot of these issues don't apply to you. So you can get away with using 9,000 byte MTUs in those cases. It's when you get tunnel networks involved, VXLAN, GRE, all that stuff, is when things get a little weird, and that's what we're trying to address here because that's where most of the problems came in. So, but I'll agree with Sean, it's definitely difficult to, to backport everything when it comes to long-term releases. Uh, that's a whole other topic that's probably been argued a whole lot. Um, frankly, MTU should have been solved many, many, many years ago, but I can't turn back time. Any other questions? Looks like we're out of time, I think. All right, well, thanks. <laughs>